I'm uh, still muted, Pastor. We can't hear you, Pastor. All right. Uh, blessed Christmas, everyone. My my computer. This one's very old. I got a new one. Haven't set up yet. This one's delayed sometimes, so I don't know. So blessed Christmas, everyone. Thank you for the beautiful hymns and focusing on holiness, which is uh, something that we're going to talk about as well today. So um, we want to really thank the Lord because he has given us until now this day, right? So many years for many of us, so many years of our life in which uh, we can uh, recall his goodness, especially uh, within the family of God. We can recall his goodness because we all have been born, uh, you know, birthdays are a big thing for a lot of people. Uh, not for me especially, uh, because I, I don't like uh, to trouble people with all the fuss and all that. But I, I, I can understand the kind of uh, excitement birthday generates. And uh, it's good. Uh, those who have the energy and those who, who have that uh, capability to make a birthday great. But of course, we know that the, the birthday that is celebrated more than any other birthdays throughout history is the birthday of Jesus. But did you know that in the first few hundred years, the birthday of Jesus was not celebrated? Now, that's quite something, isn't it? Uh, it was only around uh, well, the date 350 AD that Pope Julius officially declared the 25th of December as the birthday of Christ. But of course, we do have uh, some discussion about the dating of Christ's birthday, maybe as early as the late second century. So after 150 AD, there were some discussions and there were debates, all kinds of debates. And, and they were trying to figure out when was Christ conceived and when he was born. Uh, but we know from the biblical record that uh, based on John's father, Zechariah's a roll call at the temple and that Jesus was conceived six months after John, uh, then, you know, Jesus was probably uh, conceived sometime in March, perhaps, and then, uh, sorry, not March, sorry, sometime in December, sorry, <laughs> my mind just, sometime in December at the time of the Feast of Lights, and then he was uh, being birthed. Uh, during the time of tabernacles around September. But, you know, all this is not really as important as learning how uh, to take that birthday of Jesus into our lives. Because when we come into Christ, uh, we are born again into a spiritual family in God. So today we will uh, have a shorter message, but... Uh, I promise you it will also be a very uh, theological and meaning filled with the revelation of God and that would help us, uh, at least those of us who still haven't quite understood uh, or to correct the way that we say, you know, we just go around and say, are you born again? Are you born again? Are you born again? Because uh, we only think in terms of conversion experience, but that's not the born again Biblically speaking, there are a few key passages in the New Testament that describes what it means to be born again. And 1 Peter 1 to chapter 2, verse 3, is, is the theologically uh, most complete explanation. There is also the other very important passage in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 3, and I've also quoted from Titus 3, when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, this is also a very good, uh, very dense, right, or very condensed theological explanation of rebirth. All right. So, but we go into First Peter chapter one to get our, our clearest uh, understanding on this very, very, very important uh, theology of rebirth. So let's be good students and let's really 
uh, from now on represent this concept rightly. And also, of course, we need to apply it to ourselves. First of all, are we really, have we really been reborn? My, uh, my thesis for the, so many years is that most people who come into faith in, in Christ through the conversion experience have not really come into a born again experience biblically. Now, we're not talking about they don't, they, they don't believe in Jesus uh, the way that Jesus wants to be believed in as the Son of God, as the Messiah of Israel. No, we are talking about born again experience. It's totally separate from just coming into a kind of acknowledgement uh, in a conversion experience. And uh, so the Apostle Peter actually gives us three very clear and true aspects of being born again. And we must keep that in mind because it is the reference point of our being born spiritually into the family of God. Now, if we do not have the association with these three realities, then our spiritual life is kind of a pseudo or fake or what we call inauthentic. So it's a pretentious spiritual life. We may have a re religious life, but we don't have a spirit life. All right. So on this day, especially when we think of Jesus uh, being born and then wrapped up in these uh, uh, clothes, cloths, and uh, placed in a manger, all right, and with the multitude of hosts praising God that was witnessed by the shepherds in the field, all right, let's understand that uh, to make this birth come alive, to to, to really celebrate this birth, we have to take the birth of Christ into our spirit man. So let's go on to the very first, which is a living hope. All right. The first aspect of uh, this being born again is born again to a living hope or hope of life. All right. But let's read the, uh, uh, the, the key scriptures here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, it's kind of surprising that you're going to talk about being born again, bringing new life in a context of having especially the greatest baby ever born with Jesus, having to live our full life and then die, or rather the life of, you know, a, a man who lived past his 30 years of age, which is pretty good or pretty standard in those days. Um, the average life was between 30 and 35. So Jesus uh, kind of fit that. But of course, Jesus could have lived on physically much longer, but he was put to death on the cross. So it's on the occasion of his death, but not only his death, but he his coming back again from the dead that gives this powerful spiritual gift of being born again to those who come to trust in his name. Now, significantly, our teaching and lesson on Born again is by given by Peter. Who who really is Peter? Peter is the foremost apostle, the one who the Lord Jesus uh, set before the rest of his twelve apostles as the lead apostle. And remember in Matthew uh, sixteen, sorry, uh, I forgot to change the reference there. It's not Matthew twenty one. In Matthew sixteen, Jesus turned to Peter and said. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of, all right, it should be Hades, sorry, I just took a, a translation and put it in, so my mistake here, uh, this, this is a very bad mistake on my behalf, so on the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, so it's the gates of death will not prevail against it, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so, um, so in this place where Jesus had brought his apostles as far north as he had traveled in the land uh, of Israel at that time, and it's to the place where there is a gaping hole called the gates of Hades because it's so deep that people uh, go there and throw sacrifices in, thinking that that is the transition, uh, the shaft between physical life right now and then when you die, you go to somewhere underneath the ground. All right. So, but significantly, Jesus picked Peter up just out of the, the group because Peter was the one who recognized Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah of God. He was able to say it, and Jesus said that flesh and blood did not reveal that to him. No human person revealed that to Peter, but God the Father revealed that to Peter. And so Peter was recognized by the Lord Jesus as someone who would be given uh, authority, all right, uh, in his ecclesia and his church, in the call out ones. So he has teaching authority, he has speaking authority, and uh, later on Jesus were to give him and the other apostles, except for Judas, the right even to cancel sins, right? So that is a priestly right in the Old Testament. Only if you are the anointed priest, you can carry out the ceremony and you can pronounce a person to be released from certain obligations, including failures, etc. So he became an authorized spokesperson. And it's important that we get our authority from the true authority. It's very important, especially when we believe that we are truly sons of God, that we truly will are called to be kingly priests, to sit on thrones with the Lord Jesus, that we are connected to the right authority. And our authority is always, always established by the word of God as taught by the apostles and reflected by the apostles of the Old Testament and all of scriptures. All right, so we have... Uh, this very, very important task of making sure we get it right. And there are many things that tradition has got, gotten it wrong. And yes, even for hundreds of years, even for over a thousand years. And we know it because when Martin Luther came forward and John Cal Calvin, or even before that, there are others who died for speaking out against the tradition. And all the way down to this age, there are those who would suffer persecution within the larger established uh, forms of uh, Christian faith because they're so used to certain views that they become doctrinized and fossilized. So the doctrines become like written on solid rock. No. The real teaching comes from someone who is appointed by heaven, someone is authorized by the Lord Jesus. And I believe up to this day, only those who have been authorized by heaven will continue to be given the revelation understanding to continue to uh, teach uh, more and more and more of the things of God. It's not just anyone who desires uh, to be a teacher or anyone who thinks that they are a, a good teacher. Someone who, whom the Lord has picked and chosen and discipled and someone who, who understands uh, how it is uh, to to be discipled into Christ, into the word. Now, there are these four expressions of this uh, living hope, right? So, born again to a living hope. Now, why did I have hope of life just below the living hope? Well, first of all, to help us understand that there are two main uh, manuscript traditions, the Greek traditions, which is a living hope, and the what we call the Syriac, the Aramaic, right? The tongue that Jesus spoke, the Peshitta, that 
tradition has hope of life. And why is it important for us to distinguish these two? And I believe that both are true. The living hope is the expectation or is of, of uh, that is ever true, ever fresh. That means that it, you know when people lost their hope means they don't believe that something promised would happen. All right. So there's like like a dead, so a dead hope almost. So you 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 want to bring forward the living hope as in this hope is alive, even though it is not yet. This hope is kept alive, it's something based on something real. Now, on the other hand, if we take the Syriac uh, text, the hope of life, it means that you are hoping for something which is called life. So can you hear that this has a, another powerful but uh, quite different meaning from a living hope and a hope of a life, all right? So a living hope, what is that hope? It could be life or it could be more. It could be the blessings that we talk about, the heavenly spiritual blessings. Whereas the hope of life is you're hoping to have that life. And what is that life? Is it physical life? Is, is this the life that would never end? Is it a life of God in us? And it's, it's all that. It can be all that for some, and it can most definitely be the hope of this life of God, that God puts his life in you because your command, his commandments lives, live in you, and you are walking out the power of an indestructible life because you obey the commands of God from a pure heart and a true conscience. So moving on to, to this hope of this life of God, or you can say this living hope of all that God has promised, we see that it is first a heavenly inheritance. So you, you are given a living hope uh, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. All right, kept in heaven. So that means it's not kept on earth. The, the word heaven is in the skies. So in the beyond. In the New Testament, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we also have the phrase kingdom of the heavens, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. So the kingdom of God is equivalent to the kingdom of the heavens. That's the word, the uranos, right? So the the one that is in the skies. So, so we are talking about an inheritance that is kept with God in the realm where God is, which is contrasted from the realm where we kind of live in. The only place where heaven touches the earth is in the holy temple and especially in the holy of holies, all right? And in the holy place. So that on earth, for the Jews and the early Christian believers was at the physical temple of Jerusalem. So the temple became the meeting place of the heavens and the earth. Now, and it says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith, this, this inheritance, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the eschaton. Now, I put the Greek word in there, and that's the word that we now come to uh, popularize eschatology, meaning doctrine, teaching of the last time, the end day. Now, ready to be in the last time. When Peter said that, and every one of the apostles who used that word eschaton, including Jesus, they're referring to their own generation. Their own generation whose time clock for this last time happened with the coming of John the Baptist and Jesus. 
the Messiah. And that's spoken by Jesus himself and by every one of the apostles writing the New Testament. So we should not challenge that. We should not challenge that. We must believe that Peter believed and all the other apostles that that was the very last uh, block of time given to the nation of Israel where those who would call upon the name of Yahweh save us, Yeshua, by repenting, taking the baptism of repentance uh, through water that John had started, that they would now be taken into this purified, cleansed and forgiven family of God in Israel. And so this is an earthly deliverance or earthly salvation that was ongoing in and around them, right? To, to those who believe they are being delivered, Paul says, but to those who not, they are perishing with the age. So we have to understand that, that this particular description is meaningful and purposeful and powerful for that generation of Jews and some of the Gentiles who joined them in believing in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. So we cannot translocate it to thousands of years later when it's meaningless to them. And the word is, uh, the word salvation or deliverance ready to be reviewed. The word ready, the Greek word suggests very, right there, all right? It's so immediate. So again, you cannot look at that and translate it into oh, one time, one day, thousands and thousands of years later, and has nothing to do with the nation of Israel, of which uh, Peter and the apostles and the, the people he was writing to uh, were part of. And then that salvation refers to generations like us. So that is totally destroying the, the meaning and the power that was applied to Peter's own audience and his own generation. Now, the third aspect of this living hope is a life of trials. And again, that's a contradiction. Okay, you can understand a living hope or hope of the God life or the good life or the life eternal. You can think of it as there is some heavenly inheritance waiting for us. And you can think of it as, oh, there's a physical earthly deliverance when, when God comes to judge this nation, we are being delivered. But then, in this hope, there is also a guarantee of a life of trials. And yet, it says in verse 6 of First Peter chapter 1, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, for you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation, at the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the phrase, the apocalypse of Yeshua Christo, which appears in the book of Revelation. So when you read the book of Revelation, it is fulfilling or it is describing this fulfillment. All right. When Jesus is, is being revealed the way that he is, that he really is the king and the judge, that, that he really had come to judge that generation of Israel that using the, the hands of uh, the fourth beast, which is Rome, or the sea beast is Rome, right? Pictured in Revelation 13 and connected to Daniel chapter uh, 7. Very clearly, it's the Roman Empire, but cooperating with Babylon, that harlot, which is Jerusalem, very clearly that 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 generation 
would be judged. First, spiritual Babylon, which is Jerusalem, would copulate with Rome and work with Rome to bleed out the saints who believe in the word of God and in the testimony of Jesus. So they will continue to persecute the saints. But later on, the Babylon, the harlot, which is Jerusalem, would be itself would be killed by Rome, which is what was fulfilled during that generation. All right. So in the end, the, the same political leaders who co and religious leaders and the communities who cooperate with Rome to persecute the Christian believers, they, in the end, in the final, you can say three and a half years before the Temple of Jerusalem was burned to the ground, these Jewish leaders and the communities were killed by Rome itself. So that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. However, during that time of the judgment, during that time when Rome turned against Israel and Jerusalem, and that happened in the last year of Emperor Nero, but just before that, he put to death, probably around AD 64, he put to death the two most outstanding witnesses of Jesus Christ, and that is Peter and Paul. And I believe Peter and Paul are pictured in Revelation 11 as the two witnesses. So pictured in a way that they were killed by the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where the, our Savior also was crucified, we're told. And so imagine that letter. Peter and Paul had just in recent times been, been both crucified in Rome by Nero. And now the Roman army is coming to destroy the land in Israel. And now the people, the Christians everywhere, they, they listen to this letter from the book of Revelation, that there are two witnesses who would die in Jerusalem and then who would rise again after, the, after three days. They are thinking spiritually that Peter and Paul, just like Jesus, would rise after three days in the spiritual. And so the physical description uh, is only a way of describing spiritually what really is happening. So the believers are not dull. The believers at that time, they are very smart people. They can understand the symbolism well enough, right? It did not come as a mystery to them because it's fresh within their living mind and memory. All right, so, so these believers who believe in Jesus, they will go through the, the trial of the test of their faith because like Jesus said, from city to city, they'll persecute you, synagogue to synagogue, they'll flog you. And some of them, some of you, they will even kill you. But even though you're killed, don't worry, you have a living hope, you have a hope of life because not one hair of your head would be destroyed. Yep, physically, they might even end up physically dead, but they have a hope of life. They have that living hope. And, you know, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is him coming as the one pictured as riding on the clouds and now visiting the land, like in the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's how the picture of God is presented. But then on the ground, God is using the Assyrian armies, God's using the Babylonian armies, and in the time of Jesus and Paul, God is using the Roman armies to destroy the destroyer of the land, to destroy what the Book of Revelation called the earth dwellers, the inhabitants of the earth who persecute the saints, the holy ones of God, who are the Christians. But because of this judgment that is poured out by Rome upon the land, the words of Jesus and every one of the apostles speaking about this judgment to come upon Israel is being fulfilled. So, so the only ones who are glorified and who can give the praise and honor and glory to God would be the Christian believers, those who believe the word of Jesus and his apostles, which came true for them in that generation. Now we go on to the next 
two verses that explain that earthly salvation more fully. And here we are surprisingly given three reasons why the those persecuted Christians who have that living hope in them, but yet who had to, uh, and who had an inheritance in heaven, and who would be delivered, all right, out of that ordeal, and yet they had all kinds of trials. And we are told that the reason they are given that deliverance, that salvation, are three reasons. Though you have not seen him, you love him. So it's because of love. There's a love relationship. Secondly, though you do not now see him. In other words, Jesus already died and resurrected, and the people that Peter was writing to, uh, the latter could well be in the early 60s, just before Peter perished in, in the hands of Rome. He says, though you do not see him now, yet you believe in him. So faith is believing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And in this case, it's just like you and I. You and I, we have not seen him, Jesus, but yet we love him and we believe in him. And the third thing is, you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So can you imagine the early, uh, those Christians at that time, even amidst their suffering, great trials, they rejoiced with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, and so obtain the outcome of your faith. The, again, the salvation is the word soteria, which means the welfare, the deliverance, the safety of your lives. Now, when the translation it's just obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Immediately, we would be thinking the way uh, popular Christianity has shaped it. Oh, it's about our soul being saved so that it's not going, to, not going to go to hell and going to heaven. But it's totally not that at all. Totally not that at all. It's talking about something that God wanted that generation who turned to him because they are the first one to now call upon the name Jesus as Yeshua, save us. And they are willing to come into that new everlasting covenant talked about by especially Jeremiah and Isaiah and, and hinted many, many other places throughout the Old Testament. And so this is that living hope, hope of life. Let's move on to the next aspect of born again. And the second one has to do with a holy living, right, a consecrated life. So we have the living hope. So the living hope is characterized by four things, right? The living hope was described by five things early on, but now we see the living hope. If you have that living hope in you, if you have that hope of life in you, the audience of Peter, when they had that living hope in them, there are four evidences of that. And so today we can apply it to us as well. So the first is an awakening mindset. Let's read from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action have a lively mind, ready to act on your mind. And being sober-minded, sober-minded, you're not drunk. You're the opposite of drunk. You're very, very, very alert. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right? So this hope is going to come to you when Jesus come and fulfill all his word and show his that he's, he's judging all things, that his words come true to judge that generation. So it is a mind that is awakening. Now, as a disciple, as a true student, you have to have an awakening mind set, or you will not learn very much. All of us have gone to school, and we understand how it was so important that our mind is awakening more and more to the many, many 
realities around us and inside us. And that's the only way that we can grow in that hope of growing up, having an education, uh, getting through some critical stages of our educational path. The same with coming to the Academy of God, where we are learning of God. We have to have an awakening mind, a mind that awakens more and more and more and more and more. So it cannot be a mind that has become dull and, and is not able to learn, right? So that would speak of, you know, just like a, a fish tank and it had the same still water with nothing except whatever it already had and things get more and more still. But it's a living tank, you have to put in water, maybe running constantly and put in some oxygen uh, uh, kind of uh, tubes in there. And then you have to add fresh food and clean out some of the waste material, etc. So that's how we should have an awakening mind, to, to be born again into a holy living, into a holy living, we have to have an awakening mind, a mind of a student who is actively being purified, cleansed by the word of God. The next thing is a uh, to departing ignorance. The second characteristic of a living hope in you and me is we depart from ignorance. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your formal inner ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so you shall be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. All right. Now, this is a very powerful scripture taken from Leviticus, uh, and you can say 1144, Le Leviticus, right there. The community of God is called out of ignorance or not knowing God. The greatest ignorance is not having the knowledge of God, but it's called out of not knowing God at all or just knowing all the wrong things, but not knowing the real thing. And then it's called into a special consecrated place of God to have a holy knowledge of God. Why? Because the word holiness uh, means that you are separated for God and now you are fully consecrated to him. You belong to him. Now, when we think of the word holy or holiness, popularly, the word that comes into mind is, oh, do not sin, right? In other words, we, we contrast holy, holy with sin, but that's the wrong contrast. Poor theology, bad theology, sloppy theology will lead to all kinds of ignorance. And this is one case. The right contrast in the Bible, the opposite of holy is common, profane, for the commoner. Holy is for the ones who've been set apart for the, for the king, for royalty, for the great nobility. So we should contrast it rightly. Holiness should be equated with, all right? So it should not be contrasted with sin. It should be contrasted with what is common, with com commonness. But holiness, when we think of holiness, we should think of consecration. That means giving of yourselves, devoting of yourselves wholly to God. Giving of yourself wholly to God. So imagine many Christians who feel that they are doing okay because you know what? Uh, they, they, they don't sin very much, right? Uh, they, are very, they lead a simple life. They don't, what you call, do a lot of obvious sins, right? And then they think that they are being holy, right? No, it's, even if they sin much, if they are real Christians, they are holy people because the word holy... It's also used to describe Christians in the New Testament. All throughout the word holy, the holy, the holy, the holy ones. It's Christians are those who are consecrated, set apart. And do Christians sin even in those days? Oh, yes. 
how about in our day? Of course, right? So the fact of falling or because of sin, straying because of sin, doesn't deholify you. It just means that you are in sin. And you are in sin, which you should not be in that manner, because you are holy people right now. You are not like the commoners who, who are very ignorant, who don't know about the glory of God, who don't know how to come and, and, and give God the glory. Right? So you have that understanding because now you have a holy life. You are a life given to God. This is very important, so I hope that you grasp it. Now, we are not downplaying on the uh, aspect of sin. We are just setting it in the right context. So in the eyes of God, the Pharisees and the scribes, they... Yeah, they sin less, but they really are much more of a commoner than of being the holy ones. In fact, Jesus would go as much as saying to these very, very sinless religious community as you are the children of your father, the devil, and you are this generation of vipers and snakes. Because they... He says, you have the word of the eternal, you, you seek, for, seek for the words of eternal life. And, and I'm standing right here at you. And yet, you know what? You want to kill me. That's in John 5. Because you don't have the word of God abiding you because you don't have the love of God. So when you are wholly devoted to God, you have the word of God in you and you have the love of God and you have eternal life. Now, another thing for you to think about in all of John's uh, epistle, First John, you will not find the word holy except as applied to Jesus, the Holy One, who gives us the anointing that teaches us all things, right? But yet in the, in chapter one, two, and three, especially, uh, there's, a, there's almost a, a mini thesis on sin, right? And how all have sinned and that if you confess your sins, you'll be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and how you should not sin, right? And finally, how you have come to a place where sin is conquered because it's no longer a major thing that traps you down. So the one who really has purified himself and come into that hope to be like Jesus no longer falls into that pattern of falling short of God's glory. But all throughout, there's no discussion of holiness, right? So that will give you a, a, a even fuller reflection on, on holiness, how it has to do with consecration and the love of God, than rather uh, just falling into sin. Now, the third aspect of the living hope in a person, if you are born again, is you put on a reverential fear of God. Do you have a reverential fear of God? Here, Peter says, verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time in this eschaton for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So we move on from the third to the fourth. All right, so you not only put on a reverential fear to God, but now you are focusing your mind and your thoughts 
on God because of Jesus. He he was so alive and then he was so dead in a public way and he was so resurrected also in the eyes of so many living witnesses at that time. And because of that, you have believed. And you believed, uh, so you give glory to God in Jesus. You go, give glory to Jesus and to God for that. But the end of it is so that your faith are hope and hope are in God, so that God is forcing you, Peter is telling that generation, forcing you because of Jesus to now focus on God and the love of God and the plans of God and the all the preparations of God to give you that living hope, that heavenly inheritance, that earthly now, right now, earthly life right now, even though you suffer all kinds of trials and problems, and yet your life, as far as concerned, is a healed a wholesome life, a life filled with the life of God. is Your life is a soul, soterium. It's a life that, that has been so, so made whole. You've made whole in Him. All right? So your life is made whole in Him. And yes, many of you have gotten the physical sozo, the physical salvation. And, and all of you have gotten that spiritual wholesomeness, the sozo uh, uh, of your life in God. So this holy consecrated life that you live reflects the character of God in you, right? The character of God in you. And you are now focusing your life with all your mind paying attention to God. And that's how I recall Luke chapter 12. And this is such an important passage. Luke chapter 12, 35 to 48. All right, so from 35, Luke chapter 12, it says, Stay dressed for action, Jesus says, and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. Who is Jesus talking to? It's to his disciples gathered before him. He says, you guys be like those men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Amen, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. All throughout the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Luke and Mark, there is the repetition of this theme of Jesus coming back to his disciples and making sure that his disciples are ready for his coming back to judge. And he even says in Matthew 16, some of you standing here will not see death before the Son of Man, that he himself comes in, in his glory to judge and to reward this land. And, and there, are, there are other uh, references, so many of them, if you begin to hear what the word actually tells. You will not miss them. Very sadly, most people uh, do not bother to have a, a, a real theological or you can say God education. Most Christians don't. So most Christians, very sadly, um, have become accustomed to just wanting to hear messages that kind of uh, bring some thrill or bring some uh, comfort, bring some cheer, instead of uh, something that addresses the mind so that your mind can be awakened more and more. And so, very sadly, the Christian culture down the ages, and especially our own, uh, just wants to hear and uh, be, be thrilled with exciting things instead of to be given that divine understanding and knowledge. But you and I, we are going to be different from this generation. We are going to truly be holy and consecrated unto God. And we're going to fear God. And have, we put on a reverential fear of God. Because why? He has given us his very life. He has redeemed us and bought us with a price of his own life, the life of the very God who became very man. And so... 
we must always reflect that fear. Very sadly, I also have to testify openly again and again that much of the Christian church that I've seen through the over 50 years of being in the Christian church, there are many sh showing of lack of fear, lack of reverence towards God from every aspect of the Christian living, Christian lifestyle, Christian meetings, Christian worship services, Christian events. Does that therefore speak of a generation who is not really or quite born again according to what is described here by Peter? We've got to be honest. We, we have to stop tolerating the adulteration of the pure word of God. We have to put a stop to that first in ourselves. Now, we can't put a stop in others except those who would want to listen to us, those who want to engage in serious reflection as with a serious sober mindset set towards the things of God. But we can always be that person who really is carried by a living hope so that we can have a holy life and a holy mindset to reflect the character of God. Now, again, if you read on to First Peter 1 and verse 10, yeah, he's expanding on this salvation for that eschaton, concerning this salvation for you guys right here living in the first century <laughs> AD. All right, that's what Peter is saying. Concerning this salvation for you guys, it's not talking about the salvation that future teachers is going to teach, including our own generation right now uh, that's talking about this. So we are destroying the words of Peter here to his community. We are destroying their meaning. We are destroying their purpose. Let's give it to them. Give it back to them. Concerning this salvation, you first century uh Christian generation with me, Peter, the lead apostle. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Prophesied about the grace that is to be yours, the kindness, the good gift of God that is to be yours. Yes, it's a very specific grace given to that generation who is going to escape the impending judgment of God because of the wrath of God. Now, if you apply it for future generation, and since Jesus did not come for the last 2,000 years, this even this scripture, if you can think deeper into it, will be impossible. In other words, you are saying that there is no grace in between the 2,000 years since, and the only grace is going to be reserved for the final, 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 final generation of Jesus to come. And maybe, you know, in the year 2024, or maybe some people laugh about it in the year 2124. Oh, who knows? You know, we make jokes about this. Even serious people make jokes about this. It's because of our theological ignorance. That's why we can joke like this. But do you... If you think about it, this scripture, 1 Peter 1, verse 10, that speaks about this grace, would mean that this grace does not exist at all for that generation that Peter is talking about, and also for every subsequent 40-year generation down. Right? So uh, it's, it's, a more, it's, a, it's a point that requires a deeper reflection, and unfortunately, we don't have the time to expand on this. But those of you on my other study, uh, or on one-to-one -one study, I can help you understand more. You can call me. Now, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So think about the spirit of Christ. And his end. It's not talking about the same spirit that Jesus blows into the disciple in that way. Or it's talking about the word of Christ in the Old Testament. The word of God in the Old Testament that talks about Christ is the spirit of Christ. It's talking about the word that they received from heaven. All right. 
So that's what it's talking about. So the word of Christ that was in them or the breath of God that spoke about the Messiah to come that was in them. All right. So they wanted to know. They wanted to know who is that person or when is that time this Messiah will, will be. Right. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. However, like the prophet Isaiah talking about, you know, the servant of the Lord to come or Jeremiah, the righteous branch to come or uh, Zechariah talking about uh, the king and the priest to come. All right. They here, Peter says it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. So. So they knew that, oh, it was not for our time, but it's for a time to come. And that time has come in Peter's generation. Because he says it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, you, my contemporaries in the first century AD. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, or by the breath of God, the breath that comes from the Holy God, or by the teaching, by the word of the Holy God, sent from heaven things into which angels long to look into. Very powerful, right? And so we have to have this mindset, an alert, mindful, student, and faithful servant mindset that characterizes being born again, that we are being born again. But if we are dull and we are sleeping and we, we don't fear God and we disrespect things and people and authorities and we don't really have a respect for the word of God and we don't really focus on God and knowing him, then what evidence of being born again do we have? Let's move on finally to... Okay, the, th the third um, big theological aspect of born again, it is a godly family. You are part of a godly family with unfeigned love. So here it sp speaks about communion with one another in God. Now, so the consecrated life that we just looked at, that reflects that living hope that you are really born again will give birth to or engenders. That's a word that actually also suggests giving birth, like gender, right? Gendering. So engenders five spiritual realities. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That's the first thing. And unhypocritical love. I, I translated it that way because in the Greek, it is actually that. That sincere brotherly love, sincere is, is the word for anti-hypocritos. Remember who uses the word hypocritos? Who was the one who popularized that word in history that now we come to use the word hypocrite? It's Jesus. Jesus used that term to describe an actor on the Greek stage, Greek drama stage, a hypocritus, and he, he calls that generation of religious leadership hypocrites, especially the religious leaders. You hypocritus. But now we are told by Peter, Jesus, lead apostle, that if you are born again, you are born again into a family that does not walk like that hypocritical family of Israel that governed Israel at that time. Right? So you would have purified your souls by obedience to the truth coming into the light of God. In other words, you don't just do things pretentiously. You know, remember Jesus said that, you know, you guys, you Pharisees, you like to blow the trumpet when you go down the street, how you prayed and so well, and then you like to display 
how much you have given. These are hypocritical actions. You are hiding behind the mask. All right, that's that's what a stage player does. You you change your mask and you can be anyone, uh, as long as you have the another mask, another mask, another mask. You know, I have a huge intolerance for for falseness and feigness. I get very upset, right? I like a love to be true and pure to anyone or from anyone, right? And you should also like that if Jesus had the same intolerance for hypocritical or feigned, pretentious, pretending love. It's either you love or you don't. Don't pretend that you do when you don't, right? And so, but you have to understand how to define love and be defined by love the way the Bible defines it, not by how you defined it, or I just defined based on the, the world, right? So that's our problem. Bad theology can influence the way we think and the way we even define such a subject as love. So everybody says, I love God, I love you, but that's not true. We are lying on top of the hypocrisy and on, on top of the feigning tongue, the lying tongue of that pretending tongue, we are actually much into the art of falsehood. Here is a very powerful scripture, 1 Peter 1, 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere, unhypocritical, brotherly love or family love, that word is Philadelphia, which is brotherly or family love. It's, it's a word also uh, only really use the way and come to mean what it, it is for the Christian church. It means the family of God, those who are true brothers. We're not Philadelphia. We're not talking about just blood brothers. All right. Blood brothers don't qualify for Philadelphia. Unless the blood brothers really love one another with a true unfeigned love, then that is Philadelphia. So in the context of brotherhood, in, in the Christian body where you come from different bloodlines, you can have that only when you come into uh, that born again life with Jesus. If you're not really born again, it's quite impossible for you uh, to come into that sincere, unhypocritical love of the family of God. Because here you will love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Pure heart, so precious. Now, in life, it is such that you can love with a pure heart, but it doesn't mean that others will love you back or even love you back with a pure heart. All right. So, but at least it starts with you. We always start with ourselves, always starts with ourselves. And we don't lose anything just because others cannot respond the same way goes on to say, 1 Peter 1, 23, since you have been born again, right? Born again. Anaganel, again to be born. Since you have now been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So here you have a, a new birth, really a new birth, because you have an abiding seed, which is the word of God. The word of God must become like a living seed in us that is not perishable. If we do not have the love of the word of God centered in our life, then we surely don't have an imperishable seed. If we can just play fast and loose with the word of God, we don't have a true seed of God inside us. To have a true seed of God inside us, that word is, is alive. It's like a seed, all right? And so then, uh, of course, uh, a quotation from Isaiah here, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word, Peter says, is the gospel that was preached to you. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus and all his teaching. And here, if you go back to 1 John, 
1 or John 1, 1, you are here. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Right, so we're talking about Jesus and all his spirit, all his teaching, all his breath, his baptism of the spirit of himself into the disciples. But this word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven inaugurated, brought into your life by Jesus Christ. And we move on to the fourth and fifth aspects of this uh, godly family with unfeigned love. In chapter 2 now, verse 1, First Peter chapter 2, verse 1, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. So this is one of those what we call sinless. But notice it did not include many, many, many other things right? Stealing, murder, and so forth. Because here it's focused on what? The, the mindset. To focus on the heart, the unblemished soul. That means that you are untainted even into the very depths of your thinking because you put away all malice, all ill will. You wish people ill. You know, this is something very serious. Many people wish other people ill just because they are in disagreement. And that can include sometimes Christian believers. You want to see the bad outcome of some person because you don't like them or because they have somehow injured you knowingly, unknowingly. Or perhaps they didn't. You just thought they injured you. And then now you wish ill for them, right? You may not go and kill them, but you kill them with your thoughts or you are you you seem not to love them so much that's that's also a form of malice so put away all malice and all deceit all lies falsehood false sayings and hypocrisy or pretenses and envy or envy means you you desire somebody else's something right so envy and all slander, all bad speaking. Slander is speaking badly about another person. So an evidence, a clear evidence here of the consecrated life, the born again life is you have an unblemished. That means that your soul, your inside is clean, is pure. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into your wholeness, your salvation, grow up into the, the eternal life that you have, that surrounds you, that fills you. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So indeed, if you have really tasted, indeed you have taken the seed, the word of Christ, inside you, the teaching of Christ, the seed. If indeed you have, then Inside you, there would come a spiritual longing for more of the revelation of that word. So here we have it. Very clear theological mapping of what it is to be born again. Given to us by the Apostle Peter, who was schooled by the Lord Jesus. During the time when Jesus was with them before the cross and even Afterwards, for 40 days, Jesus taught them the kingdom of God. And maybe beyond that, uh, Peter might get visitation from the Lord. And so uh, may we uh, get to understand this very, very important theological concept of born again, because it affects each one of us and it affects all of Christendom. But don't be, uh, uh, you know, don't lose heart just because you haven't gotten all of this yet. Just go over this uh, teaching from Peter and here explain more fully, preferably is acceptable unto God. Uh, and, uh, and even if others in your family, in your church, in the church communities don't appreciate or don't understand, don't be discouraged. 
That's what marks you out to be a son of God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you again in Jesus' name because of what we have been called into, what we have been chosen for, because we have been uh, characterized by you into the character of God through Christ to come into union, communion with you and in the family. Once again, we lift up uh, all of us, first of all, within this family that you have put together. Let us be a, a real consecrated family that walks in unfeigned love. Lord, you have a spiritual family that spans history, uh, that crosses realms from heaven to earth. And so we are part of this growing family. And may we here, this little group at GEM, may we truly be counted as that family that is truly born again. And Lord, uh, as, as we journey through life, Lord, may we continue to grow uh, into our uh, rebirth in Christ powerfully so as to give you praise and honor and glory. And, uh, and we pray that uh, even through us, this testimony of what it is to be born again can be uh, given to those that you will bring near to receive your word. Thank you for listening to our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.